Genesis chapter 19. This is our text this morning. We're going to read one verse, but we're going to begin a journey this morning uh, that we're going to have to conclude tonight. I know you want to eat lunch, so uh, we're going to stop, okay, about halfway. Uh, when I sent all this in on Monday uh, to our ladies who take care of all of this for the pro presenter and for TV and all of this stuff, and uh, <laughs> uh, they were thinking, Pastor, uh, this is a lot of stuff. I said, yes, it is. Brother Paul even said that. So I'm not going to try to load your wagon too heavy, but uh, let, let's kind of look and see where we have been so we can understand where we are. Now, we're going to refer a lot back this morning to chapter 13. And because of what happens in chapter 13, we're going to uh, see where we are in chapter 19. Uh, is that we, we talked about this, about the decisions that you make today uh, are going to affect you tomorrow. They're going to have an outcome. They're going to have a consequence. And so uh, as we study uh, foundations, Genesis, uh, the beginnings, what God is teaching us, we need to understand this, is that first and foremost, our foundation is Christ and Christ alone. We have no hope, we have no salvation, there's no forgiveness apart from the Lord Jesus. And so that foundation is sure and steadfast. Now, chapter 19, we go back to chapter 18 to really understand. Remember in chapter 18, we meet Abram and he is entertaining the Lord. The Bible says the Lord, two men, they come to Abram. Abram's in his tent. And as they come to Abram, the Bible tells us that Abraham begins to converse with the Lord. Now, this is what's called as a Christophany. It is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus. And so the Lord with these two angels appear to Abraham. Abraham extends hospitality to them. And as he does this, the Lord announces to Abraham that that promise that I made to you 25 years before is going to come to pass. And that is, you're going to have a son. Isaac is going to come. Uh, the Bible says uh, earlier we have studied where Abraham laughed, and the Bible says here that Sarah laughed. But God has the last laugh. He gives them a son. His name is Isaac, and Isaac's name means laughter. So God does have the last laugh. And the promised one does come. Now, the Bible tells us, as the Lord tells this to Abraham, that Abraham stands yet before the Lord. So Abraham is still in conversation with the Lord. The two angels depart. Now, the Bible says that they came during the day. These two angels leave, and they are headed toward Sodom. Now, the Bible tells us that Abraham, and you studied this last week, that Abraham interceded for Lot. Why? Because the Lord said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Lot is there. Abram loves Lot. Lot's his nephew. And so Abram begins to intercede. And you know the story how he asked if there were 50 righteous, would you destroy, would you spare the city for 50? And then he went to 45 and to 40 and then down to 30 and to 20. And finally he said, would you spare the city for 10? And he said, I'll spare the city for 10. Well, there were not 10 righteous, but Lot was there. And God spared Lot. Why? Because of the intercession of his godly uncle Abraham. So it does matter that we pray for one another. It does matter that we intercede for one another. The Bible says that the prayers of a righteous man availeth much, accomplish much. So we are to be intercessors. We are to, to be prayer warriors. And so we studied this last week. What we learn from chapter 18 is we have a picture of Abram. We have a picture of the blessed life. Here's a man that loves God, and he is in fellowship with God, fellowship with the Lord. Now, Abram is standing in his tent when the Lord comes. You go to chapter 19, and chapter 19 focuses on Lot. And we're going to see Lot and his lot life 
reflects the blighted life. His life, unlike Abraham, Abraham's life produced blessings and joy. Lot's life is going to produce sorrow and trouble. We see Abraham standing at the tent. We see Lot sitting in the gate of Sodom. The contrast between these two, joy, trouble, blessings, blight. And so as we come to chapter 19, we are now seeing these two angels about to enter into Sodom. They're going to deliver the message. They're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but they're going to rescue Lot. So don't ever give up on anybody. Don't ever cease praying for someone. You just keep believing God and keep trusting God. For God, the Bible says, is able to do abundantly above all that we're even able to ask or to think, more than we can even comprehend. God is able to do that. And so as we come to chapter 19, we're going to focus this morning and this evening on the phrase, sitting in the gate of Sodom. Let's stand in honor and reverence to the reading of God's Word. We're going to read one verse, verse 1, chapter 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. Now remember, the Lord and these angels came to Abram during the day. These angels come to Lot in the evening. It's getting dark. Look what it says. And it says that they saw him, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Lot sees there's something about these two men that demand reverence, that demand honor. And so he bows before them. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that today every one of us here would leave knowing that our hearts, our lives are bowed to the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray if there's anyone here today that's involved in sin, if there's anyone here that has substituted their ideas for the authority and the integrity of the Scripture, I pray that you will minister to them, convict them, and draw them to Jesus, and draw them, God, to the acceptance and belief of your Word. Father God, I pray that you would help us today to learn the lessons from the Scripture, that we might apply these principles to our life, that we might bring honor and glory to Jesus, that God, in and through the witness of our lives, that God, we could influence other people with the grace of God, the goodness of God, that people might be saved for the glory of God. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now what we see here in this passage of Scripture is here is a man that is out of fellowship with God. You see, there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. Lot has severed fellowship with Jehovah. He is totally out of fellowship with God. Now, the Bible tells us that because of Lot's disobedience, that the consequences of disobedience followed him. Now, remember, God forgives sin immediately. If you ask God to forgive you, you repent of your sin and trust him, God, forgive me. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God will forgive you. There's nothing that you have done, I have done, any person have done, anything that you can do that God will not forgive you. God will forgive you. Only one sin God will not forgive, and that's unbelief. That is refusing the forgiveness of God. And so God will forgive you. But understand this, that although God forgives There are consequences that come from disobedience. There is a price to pay. You sow to the wind, you reap to the whirlwind. In other words, 
are we going to obey God? Are we going to do what God says? Now, the Bible tells us that Lot was a saved man. He was a righteous man. Now, if you just read the text in Genesis, you would think, my goodness alive, how could this man be a believer in God? How could he have a relationship with God? Well, we go to the New Testament. Remember this, the New Testament and the Old Testament does not contradict each other. The New Testament and Old Testament complement one another. Remember, you find the Old Testament uh, or the New Testament in the Old Testament concealed, and you find the New Old Testament in the New Testament revealed. In other words, we see what God says. It ties together like a tapestry. The Bible says in 2 Peter, you can write this down, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, that righteous man, talking about Lot, vexed his righteous soul, says he was a righteous man, had a righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So he was troubled, he was vexed by what was going on around him. First Corinthians chapter three, first Corinthians three, verse 15 says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. In other words, everything burns up, but yet he is saved. He is saved. Paul is saying that you build on that foundation those things that are precious. But if you build with wood, hay, and stubble, that when the test of the fire comes, it's going to burn everything up. You're not going to have anything that is going to stand, nothing that is going to show for. And so Lot lived in Sodom, but he never was happy there. Why? He vexed his soul. It troubled him. It bothered him. But listen, ladies and gentlemen, he did not do one thing about it. He did not do one thing about it. Today, there are many, many people Men and women, and I'm going to focus on men. Listen to me, men, because you are the bell cow. You're the leader in your home. You're the leader in your home. If you're not the spiritual leader in your home, something's wrong. You are supposed to be. This is what the Word of God says. You're to be the leader. How do you lead? You lead with love. You lead with service. You lead with compassion. You are not to dominate. You are not a dictator. God created woman from the rib not from the heel. That means that that woman, you are to put your arm around her and draw her close to you to protect her, provide for her, and to help her. Not from your heel. You don't put your foot on her neck and keep her in bondage. That is totally contrary to the New Testament. You are to lead her, and brother, you can't lead her if your life is not right with God because there's no one that knows you any better than your wife. There's no one that knows you any better than that woman who's committed herself to you. So understand, gentlemen, you lead with love. You lead by consistency. You lead your family. And so there are many men today that are not leading their family. I can tell you in 44 years of preaching, the story, the tragedy of man after man after man that I've seen that walked away from God, that got away from the Lord, that pressed the envelope too close, that got to the edge. And friend, I'm telling you, that edge will give way and you will fall into a chasm that will destroy your life. You get close to that envelope, there's a place you're going to fall off. Proverbs said that a man cannot take fire and press it to his chest without being burned. God can heal burns, but burns create horrible, horrible scars that will be with you forever. Sodom was a place that scarred Lot. Sodom was a place that destroyed Lot's integrity, that destroyed his witness because he was not willing to do what is right by God and by his family. Now, what happens here? We, the text tells us that he was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When these angels come, they find him there. Why did I choose that text? Because, beloved, that's where somebody in this building is right now. 
You are sitting in the gate of Sodom. Saved soul, but in danger of having a lost life. Of everything that you love and cherish being destroyed. You see, the place the Bible tells us, history tells us, that the gate was the place where business took place, where transactions took place. It was a place where prominent men gathered. It was where government took place. It was where leadership took place. And so what we have here and learn here, that Lot was at the gate. Lot at some point, somehow, some way, had gained entrance into the main structure of that society to where he had literally went to the top as far as politics was concerned, as far as business was concerned. There are some Bible students who believe that Lot may have been a judge to judge over because this is where judgments took place. He could have possibly been elevated to a judgeship. He could have possibly been elevated to the mayorship. As it's been said, he could have gone from the camel's hair to the mayor's chair. Here this guy was, he had a place and position of prominence. He had some clout. And beloved, listen to me, gentlemen. Listen to me this morning. God gives to you blessings. God gives to you authority. God gives to you the opportunity to exercise those things, that influence, that blessing in your life, and that is going to affect not only you, it's going to affect your family. And for you to walk away from God and disobey what God says is going to bring hardship, heartache, and trouble upon everyone that you love. Now what happens here? Tragic day. Tragic day when they come and they find Lot at the gate. They come in the evening time. It's getting dark, and they find him. How in the world, what led him to that place? How do you get there? How did a man get to this place sitting in the gate of Sodom? Three things that take place here. And if you get away from God, it's going to happen to you just like this. Number one. We see Sodom's appeal. Say that with me. Sodom's appeal. Say it again. Sodom's appeal. The Bible tells us, go back to chapter 13. This is where it all starts, okay? Chapter 13, verse 10, look what it says. And Lot lifted up his eyes. This is the problem. Do you know that the eyes are the gateway to the soul? Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that what you see will ultimately you will become? Do you understand that what you see will corrupt your soul? That's the reason we must guard our eyes. The psalmist said, I will set no th wicked thing before my eyes. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, there is a pandemic today in America of pornography, and it is destroying the lives of many men who are Christians. And you need to do whatever you have to do, gentlemen, to guard your family. Your child, his innocence, her innocence can be stolen just like that. I'm telling you there are those out there that are filled with corruptness that are out to destroy you. And don't you think, well, I can handle this. You can't. Nobody can. You will get in trouble. David, the sweet singer of Israel, got in trouble by what he saw because that will begin to control and corrupt you. And so this appeal of what he saw, and he beheld the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east and separated. They separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the city of the plains. And look what it says. And he pitched his tent toward Sodom. What was the appeal? Money. Money. He wanted money. His eyeballs had what? Cash register signs, dollar signs. He was looking for the money. Show me the money. I want the money. Let me tell you something, gentlemen, just because that job offers you more money 
Just because that opportunity that you think is going to help you financially does not mean it's of God. It does not mean that that is from the Lord. Satan can take something good and he can corrupt you through it if you do not recognize the will of God. The Bible tells us Lot was a righteous man. 2 Peter 2.8, that righteous man, he suffered it all. He suffered it all. That appeal, that appeal of what he wanted. He saw the opportunity to accumulate more wealth. Beloved, how sad it is to have the things money can buy, but you don't have the capability of giving your family the things money can't buy. We have Americanized so much. We look at our economy of what we can do, what we have. And that's not happiness, ladies and gentlemen. That is a dream. That is a facade. Some of the most unhappy people in the world are those people who have everything that money can buy. So understand this. He stepped out of the shadow of his uncle. He miscalculated the cost of his decision. And because of that appeal, he destroyed everything he loved. But not only the appeal, look at the second thing, and that is the accommodations. The Bible tells us that Abraham and Lot were nomadic people. What does that mean? It means they dwelt in tents. They dwelt in tents. They lived in tents. They moved around. They would stay here for a while. Then they would move and set up camp somewhere else. And they moved their herds about from place to place. Why? Because they were finding pasture and grazing for their flocks. But in verse 12 of chapter 13, notice what it says. It says that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. So in other words, when he separates from Uncle Abraham, what does he do? The Bible says that he dwelt on the plain of Jordan. So when he separates from Uncle Abraham, he's still living that nomadic lifestyle. He still has a tent. And he's living on the plains of Jordan. But now as you continue, remember, you can't have chapter 19 without chapter 13. And the problems in chapter 19 are nothing more than the result of what happens in chapter 13. He dwells on the plain of Jordan. He's still in a tent. But then you go to chapter 14, and the Bible says that he was dwelling in Sodom. The Bible says that Abram had to help deliver him from that raid that took place in Sodom. And so what happens here is now he has moved from that tent on the plains of Jordan and then he dwells in Sodom. Now, this is a radical change, ladies and gentlemen. H have you ever been somewhere that you felt out of place? Huh? Have you? Yeah, well, you keep living. It's going to happen somewhere, somehow. You just feel out of place. Like a fish out of water. I've, I've had that happen before. And so... Here Lot is from that nomadic lifestyle. Now he's dwelling in Sodom. And this is a radical change from being outside Sodom to inside Sodom. But do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in verse 3 of chapter 19 that he urged those men to come. And it says they entered into his what? Verse 3. His house. They come in to his house. Now, let me tell you something about Abram. Abram always did two things. Two things. You study his life. Is that when he pitched his tent, when he set up camp, he always built an altar. The first thing he did, I mean, you see that. Tent, altar. Tent, altar. He moved over here. He left over here. He pitched his tent. What did he do over here? He built an altar. You see, worship. Honoring Jehovah was first and foremost that thing that motivated Abram. Now, did he mess up? Sure he did. Did he sin? Sure he did. But you know what? Abram sought the Father. Abraham lived a life of surrender and worship to God. There is no mention in the life of Lot where he ever built an altar. 
He never built an altar. He never surrendered to God. He had a he had a visible outside facade that everything was okay, but the Bible said he vexed himself. He was tormented. You see the appeal there and then the accommodation. We're going to move to a better place. We're going to get a better house. I'm going to have a better job. Things are going to be wonderful. But my friend, it was all downhill from there. So there was the appeal. There were the accommodations. Now look at the acclamation. Acclamation. Say that with me. Acclamation. Say it again. Acclamation. How did Lot become acclimated to Sodom? He's righteous, the Bible says. How in the world can a righteous man be living in that sewer of depravity? How could he do that? How could he do it? Well, that word acclamation is a verb. And it means to adjust in response to a change in environment and status. Verse 13, chapter 13 says that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly, beyond comprehension, beyond words. What happened to Lot? I believe that he got used to the dark. Now, you ever go to a restaurant that you can't read the menu? You ever have to flip your cell phone on? You know? You think, man, they need people need to eat here. They can't even pay the power bill. My goodness. But you know, they want that ambiance. You know? I don't like the dark. I really don't. I don't like it. I like light. I like it. I, I don't understand electricity, but I like it. I like it when the lights are on. When I'm preaching, I like to see people. I don't understand these dudes on these stages with smoke and everything in their skinny jeans, and they're preaching. <laughs> yeah. And, and, they got, and they got spotlight on them, you can't see anybody. I want to see who I'm talking to. I, I, want, to, I, want, to, I want to see. My soul, as dark, clumsy as I am, I fall off the stage. Listen. But, but have you ever been in one of those places? And, uh, and finally, by the time you get maybe to the end of your meal, you can see your wife. You can see your husband. You know? Well, how's that happen? You get acclimated to it. You, your eyes adjust. We, we, we adjust to that. This is what happened to Lot. Lot stayed there so long that he got accustomed to living in the darkness. He got accustomed to living by that type of mentality. He got used to that being around him, although he didn't agree to it, yet he was around it. And what happens, ladies and gentlemen, listen, when you're around sin, when you're in places and young people, your mom and dad love you and they're going to tell you there's certain people you don't need to hang around with. You know why? Bible says bad company corrupts good morals. It's in the book. Yep. You don't go to certain places. Why? Because those places, and have you ever noticed something about places that are not conducive to righteousness? Hmm? You know what they have in common? They're all dark. It's all dark. Yeah. Man, you turn the light on, people start running like roaches. <laughs> Don't want to be seen. Where does most bad things take place? Darkness. Young ladies, what your mom and dad, what your dad tell you? About you, in your automobile, park where there's a light. Park where there's a lot of people around. Hmm? Don't get out there in the darkness. Why? Because bad things happen in the dark. 
And they're just trying to protect you. Do you know Lot's not going to be able to protect his daughters? He's not going to be able to protect his family? Why? Because he got used to the dark. That became the norm in his life. And see, when you began to hang around and you began to, to frequent places and people in situations that's not conducive unto righteousness, I don't care how saved you are. I don't care how much you love God. It's going to affect you. It's going to affect you. It's going to happen. And so understand this, ladies and gentlemen. What happened a lot is he began to get acclimated to that place called Sodom. How did he get there? How do you get away from God? One step at a time. He walked away from God one step at a time. Remember, I've told you this. There are very few blowouts in the Christian life, but there are a lot of slow leaks. Have you ever noticed when you don't come to church how easy it is to miss the next week? And the next week and the next week. Have you ever noticed when you're not reading your Bible how it's easy not to read it? When you don't pray, how easy it is not to pray? Have you ever noticed how easy it is when you don't do Christian disciplines that all of a sudden you don't do it? Why? Because the Bible says that our enemy, our adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. You see, if you're, if you're saved, listen to me. If you're saved, first of all, you have an external foe, the world, okay? You have an internal foe, the flesh. This flesh doesn't want to obey. And then you have an infernal foe, the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. You say, how long am I going to be in this fight? Till you see Jesus. You understand? He's not going to let up. We can't take a day off. We can't put it on cruise control and cruise on into glory. Folks, it's a battle. And Satan's going to come against you. He's going to attack you. He knows what your Achilles is. He knows what's bothered you. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, you know, my, I just have such a problem with anger. Have you ever noticed that their problem is that all the time something's making them mad? Hmm? You see, Satan is going to attack you where you're most vulnerable. Let me tell you something. An arsonist doesn't need to work in a match factory. You understand? And so what Lot does here is he gets acclimated and he vexes his soul. Verse 7 of 2 Peter 2 says that he delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation or the lifestyle of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds or their ungodly lifestyle. That word vex means to be sorely distressed, to be troubled. You see, it indicates that Lot was exposed to the wicked lifestyles of the people of Sodom. And it troubled his soul. It tormented him. It tormented him. Because he knew that what was going on was contrary to the Lord God. You see, if you know Jesus, you may dwell in Sodom, but you're never going to be happy there. And you will never have any joy, and you will never have any peace. See, there were blessings in Uncle Abraham's tent, but there was trouble and trials in Abraham's house. And I want you to listen to me. You can come to church and you can put the smile on and you can think everything's okay. But let me tell you something. God knows what's going on in your life. And I pray that God will turn the spotlight of the Holy Spirit of God on in your life. And you'll see Jesus and you'll trust him.
Now, what happens here? Very quickly. We're going to look at this point, and we're going to close. We'll deal with the rest of this, Lord willing, tonight. But what do you lose when you compromise? What do you lose when you say, well, this is not too bad. This is just lifestyle. This is, this is okay. Everybody else is doing it. What happens when you step away from what God says? You see, Lot lost his standards. Now, we live in a world that doesn't believe in standards. They believe that what's right for you might not be right for me, and what's right for me might not be right for you. Situational ethics. Folks, let me tell you something. This Bible will never change. God's Word will never change. Now understand this. Lot lost his standard. What's the standards? His values. His convictions. He lost his moral compass. He lost his judgment of what's important in life. Three things. He lost moral direction. Moral direction. When he lived with Uncle Abraham, everything was clear. He could see it clearly. What was right, what was wrong. But you see, when he came and he dwelt in Sodom, when he came there, and it came for him to make decisions on his own. He didn't see things like Uncle Abraham is right or wrong. What he did is he blended it together. And it became very blurry and very gray. Friend, there's no gray area with God. So you're either saved or you're lost. You're right or you're wrong. You're in or you're out. You're up or you're down. No middle ground with God. To be 99% saved means you're 100% lost. Friend, God is a God of absolutes. And God will not change. Understand this. That Abraham followed God. Lot knew what he was doing. When he saw that plane, he saw, it says it was like, Joy, it was like Egypt. See, he still had some Egypt in him. And what he did, he saw that, and he wanted that. His desire for material success overrode his inner compass, that guiding force in his life. He lost his way, and the only thing that stood between him and absolute destruction was the intervention of Uncle Abraham and the mercy of a holy God. Mercy. He lost that moral direction. He lost moral discernment. One of the first things to go when you do what Lot did is you lose moral discernment. What does that mean? You will begin to say, well, that's not all that bad, and, and that's not really wrong, and, and, and they're just confused. or that. No, 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 folks. You can't go there. You see, if you start doing that, then you've lost moral discernment. You hear me? Now, ladies, you have something a lot of times that men don't have, and you know what that is? They call it intuition. It's not intuition. You've got discernment. Hmm? Ladies, you ever had that red flag go up? Hmm? Bing, bing, bing. Hmm? You ever tell your husband, you better watch that? Hmm? Don't look at me. Now, ah, I know y'all. And you better keep doing it, ladies. You hear me? Because the devil's after our families. He wants to destroy your husband. He wants to destroy your life, your children. You have discernment. You see, Lot had some discernment. But he lost it. Listen to what he, Hosea 7, 8 says. Ephraim, talking about Israel, he hath, hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not yet. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. Now let me ask you something. How does your hair turn gray or turn loose? Huh? How? I mean, you don't just wake up one morning and you're gray. I didn't wake up one morning and look like Mr. Clean. I mean, I, I didn't. Uh -uh. No. It's a gradual thing. It happens little by little by little. And you know what? Sometimes it happens so 
so subtly that you don't even recognize it. Hmm? You don't. You don't. It's scary, isn't it? Janet told Micah one time when he was a little boy, he said, Micah, your hair is just like your daddy's. He said, but I don't want to be bald. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? You see, he lost that discernment. Little by little by little. His ability to discern the right from the wrong was seriously impaired by his continued exposure to Sodom's culture of corruption. These men came, tried to beat down the door. Lot goes out, shuts the door behind him. These men are so corrupt. These people, and this is not according to what the Scripture teaches us. This is not just an isolated incident so of one or two. This is the prevailing sin, the prevailing culture of that city and these men came seeking homosexual relationship with these visitors, with these angels. And God's attitude toward this vile behavior became clear when he destroyed the city. You go back and read and there's some say, well, the Old Testament doesn't really mean anything. Oh, yes, it does. It's the word of God. You read Romans chapter one, God calls it abomination. It's sin, folks. And let me say this to you, before some of you get on your high horse, let me tell you something else. You're committing adultery, you're a sinner. It is sin and you better repent. You're with another man's wife, another woman's husband, you need to repent of your sin and get right with Jesus Christ. You hear me? You're lying, you need to repent. You feel with malice, you need to repent. You feel of covetous, need you to repent. Let me tell you something, folks. Sin is sin, and we need to repent, and judgment must begin at the house of God. We are to love sinners, but to hate sin. And the reason many sinners are not saved is because of the sins in the church. We need to get right with God. We need to learn how to be kind and gracious. Listen, you can hate sin and love sinners. But I'm telling you something, folks. You don't compromise the Word of God. You don't compromise what God says. There is a standard. Now, there's something about this sin of immorality that is different than any other. God calls it abomination. And God, the Bible prohibits it, and it is condemned by God. Friend, I'm telling you that God loves you, and he wants you to know that he loves you, and he cares for you, and God has a plan for your life. But that plan for you, for me, for all of us must line up with this book, and it will if we seek to obey him. And then he lost moral discrimination. What do you mean? Now, I'll tell you how messed up he was. You see, when you begin to get involved and live in a place that is corrupt and that lifestyle is around you. Look what he says, verse 8 of chapter 19. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known a man. We find these girls were betrothed to those guys who were his son-in-laws, but their marriage has not been consummated. He said, let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do you to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Now let me tell you how messed up Lot has become. He is so messed up that he didn't have the ability to notice the differences, the subtle differences here. You see, when you began to compromise and cut corners morally, you will also have difficulty with the details of moral and ethical living. Lot seemed to be oblivious to what was going on around him, and even worse, what was happening to his family. Can you imagine where Lot was morally if he was willing to offer his daughters to this mob? He said, just take my daughters. I mean, what man with any sense of morality, with any sense of wholeness, would do something like that? Oh, no. No, no, no. Oh, listen to me. You'd say, preacher, I'd die for my kids. 
I, 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 I put myself, I die for my wife and my children. I love them. I wouldn't have done that. You see, you still have a standard. Lot didn't. He lost it. I want to ask you something. Are you, are you as faithful to God as you were 10 years ago? Are we as a people as faithful? Are we? Are, are we faithful to honor and love him, to gather together together, to serve him? I mean, how are you doing with God? How is your walk with God? Today can be a time of refreshing. You're involved in sin? Repent. Turn to Jesus. Ask God to help you. He will forgive you. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have done, God will forgive you. He loves you. Would you accept that today? Some of you need to come and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. I don't know Jesus Christ. Listen, a lot of people are going to miss heaven this far. Intellectually, they believe the tenets of the faith, but you see, you get saved with your heart. Salvation is a heart relationship. And friends, if you've never given Jesus your heart, your life, you need to come today and say, I want to be saved. We can tell you from the Word of God how to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Some of you today need to come and say, you know what? I know Jesus Christ, but I've never identified with him and with his body, with the believers in believer's baptism. And you come. We're going to baptize tonight. And you can come and identify with the Lord. And then, you know what? Everybody needs a church home. You need a, you need a heavenly home. You need a physical home, but you need a church home. You need to be a place where you can serve God, where you can make your life count, where you can teach your children that, you know what? It's important to be a part of the body of Christ. Folks, this is serious. This is not a game. That's why we meet on Sunday morning, Sunday night. We meet Wednesday. Some of y'all forgot. We still have church on Wednesday night. Their Bible studies, there's something you well, I don't like the way that is. Listen, there's something you can do. You can get in here and serve God. Folks, listen. The line's being drawn in the sand. You're either going to be with the Lord or against the Lord. You better decide whose side you're on. It's not what side my daddy's on or my mama's on or my wife's on, my, hu my husband's on. What side are you on? Don't sit in the gate of Sodom. Get up and leave. Get out. Do what it needs to do. There, there's some radical things. You got problem. Listen, you may, you may have to change your job. You hear me? You, you may have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to be involved in this. I'm not going to be involved with that. I, I'm, you have to do what's right. And mem remember, doing what's right is always the hardest thing to do. Let's stand our feet, bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to pray. Our staff's going to come. And I'm going to invite you to obey the Lord today. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless your word, bless this invitation. God, I pray that every person here, those who are watching, know that you love them. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, for their sins, for all of our sins. And that there's no person this morning beyond the love and the forgiveness of God. Please, God. I pray for any person that's involved in any type of immorality, any type, God of sin, whatever it may be. Maybe not the sin of the appetite, but maybe the sin of the attitude. I pray there'd be repentance and forgiveness. God, I pray today that you'd grow this church. God, there are people that need to be saved. God, there, there are people that have trusted Jesus that now need to obey you. And God, follow you in believer's baptism that God need to plant their life in this church and serve God. Oh, God, I pray that there's somebody here today. God, they're saved. God, they need a fresh start. They need to get out of Sodom today. Father, please, I pray for that man that's struggling, for that woman that's struggling, for that teenager that's struggling with some type of sin, that to God today you'd give them victory and freedom. God, this is your time. Would you draw your net now? In Jesus' name.